Funding for Election 2016 coverage is made possible by AARP, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to helping people turn their goals and dreams into real possibilities and changing the way America defines aging. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Public and our co-sponsor AARP of North Dakota's coverage of election 2016. I'm Matt O'Lean. This is the debate between the candidates for the Republican governorship that will be determined in the June 14th primary. Our guests today are North Dakota Attorney General Wayne Stengem and Fargo businessman Doug Burgum. We did a coin flip initially and Doug Burgum will go first on opening statements. Doug? Thanks, Matt. I grew up in Arthur, North Dakota, working at the grain elevator and on our farm. I learned the life lessons of hard work, self-reliance, and the importance of building trust in every relationship. When something was broken, we fixed it, or we asked a neighbor for help. We didn't run to the government. During high school, my dad died, and I learned more valuable life lessons as I watched my mom re-enter the workforce as a single mother with three kids. After NDSU and Stanford, I discovered the power of personal computers, and I literally bet the farm to provide the seed capital for Great Plains. We grew from 10 people to 2,000 with team members coming from 220 towns across North Dakota. We built a world-class company with Class A and Class B kids. My experience matters because North Dakota is at a crossroads. Our economy is changing. We've spent too much and our tax revenues have plummeted. It matters because technology is reshaping every industry, including energy and agriculture, and we need a leader who understands where the world is going. These times demand a conservative business leader in the governor's office and it would be my honor to serve the citizens of North Dakota. Okay, Wayne Stengem, one minute opening statement, go ahead. Uh, thank you, first I'd like to thank Prairie Public for sponsoring this debate and the AARP for sponsoring it as well. Doug, welcome. Uh, I'm running for governor because I believe in North Dakota. I'm an optimist about where we've been and where it is that we can be going forward into the future. And you don't have to look back too far to realize it was 20 years ago we were talking about North Dakota emptying out and the Buffalo Commons and all of that kind of talk. We have seen a resurgence here in North Dakota. That doesn't mean we don't have challenges, we do. We are going to have to make some serious budget decisions and have discussions about that. But I think that as we go forward, if we recognize this isn't going to be business as usual, but that we can build on what we've done, further diversify, our economy and make sure that we're funding our priorities of public safety, elementary and secondary education, and continuing the tax relief that we've seen here in North Dakota. The future can be very okay, bright. that's one minute. Let's get right to the issues. Let's start with the economy, North Dakota's economy. This has been an issue between the two campaigns. Uh, clearly, the state has suffered a downturn. Something's going on. Governor Dalrymple has ordered some budget cuts. UND is going through some budget cuts. Some critics have said, why wasn't this planned for? So let's start right into this. Uh, Wayne Stengem, you go first on this issue, You're, and then Doug, you can respond. Your thoughts on what happened and where we go from here. Okay, well, of course, the answer is that this was planned for. This is something that was considered by the legislature and the governor in developing his budget to make sure that we were funding one-time priorities. $1.2 billion of the current budget was one-time funding for badly needed roads that are improved and saving lives now and then setting aside billions of dollars into a variety of savings accounts, a rainy day fund, if you will, so that we have funding that is available. Now going forward, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we certainly are going to have to make some tough decisions. We're learning from what higher education is doing. There's other ideas and things that we can do to make sure that we're, as I said, funding our priorities, continuing the tax relief, and then replenishing those savings accounts going into the future. Okay, Doug Bergham, response. Well, I would say it's hard for me to imagine that we plan to only eight months into a biennium to be cutting essential services. And, and while we can't change what's done, uh, and we do have plummeting uh, revenues and our spending at six billion, our revenues at 4.9, uh, there's lots of cutting that has, has been done, a lot of cutting that has to be done. 
I think the thing that we, we need to really focus on going forward is getting a process that sets us up for success. And part of that process is going to be improving our forecasting system, improving our budgeting system, moving to a zero-based budgeting approach, and doing some risk management because we, we as a, as citizens, we all participate in the tremendous ownership North Dakota has in the oil industry, and we weren't hedging our revenues. That's something we do at a grain elevator every night. So I think we've got lots of ideas where we can save money coming from the people on the front lines, whether it's a school teacher, whether it's a, a someone driving a snowplow or the legislators themselves. Everyone's got ideas on where we can cut. We're going to end up with a balanced budget, uh, but let's put in some new procedures and processes to allow us to be more successful going through, forward. Okay, Wayne Stengem, well, response? You know, and of course, we're always looking at better ways to forecast, but this isn't exactly like most businesses operate, and it, and it can't be because our legislature only meets every other year. So as we go forward building the budget now, we're trying to predict what the price of wheat is going to be and what the pr price of oil will be 24 or 30 months from now. That can be very difficult. That's why I think that it's wise to do the kind of things that we've done to set money aside so that when we have revenue shortfalls, we have a source of money that will be available to fill the gap. And that's what we've done. Okay, Doug Burgum, response? Well, we've set money aside, but we haven't set enough aside. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing a 4% cut right now because we've uh, the ending balance is going to go to zero. It was $700 million at the beginning balance at the beginning of last session. The rainy day fund, which took 10 years to build up at $575 million, uh, is, is down to $75 million. It will be shrinking now that we've missed the new lower forecast each of the last three months. And so I think there's a, you know, we've just spent too much. We've tripled the size of government in the last 10 years. We can't control the price of wheat and the price of oil, but we can control how much we spent. And it's time for us to have a fiscally conservative reset on what the real role and the right sizing of our government. Okay, I'll just a quick follow up to that. Then, then Wayne Stengem, quickly you and then Doug Burgum. If, if elected governor, what would your budget look like? Well, the budget will be balanced because the constitution right. requires it, of course, and that's what good business management requires. But there are going to be cuts. There's no question about that because we don't, we won't have enough revenue. And, and of course, we won't find out for certain about that until the new revenue forecast comes out sometime this summer. But it looks like we're going to have to find some uh, additional cuts that we can make. The, the first step was the process that the governor went through is he directed the agencies to cut 10 percent from their last uh, uh, last budget allocations. That's first step. But of course we're also going to make clear that we're going to continue to fund elementary and secondary education, public safety, the things I talked about at the level that uh, that we've been funding them now. But we need to go back and we're going to have to look at those agencies that received additional funding because of the oil boom in North Dakota and see if there's further justification to continue that kind of funding. So we'll be looking at all of those things. Very few things, except for what I mentioned, will be off the table. But it's going to be, I, I would say, it's not uh, complicated that you balance a budget. It's, it's not easy, but uh, it's not all that complicated because you just have to go through the process and make sure that your expenditures equal your revenue ex expectation. Okay, final word on this, Doug Burgum, then we're going to move on. Well, it is, uh, it, it's not complicated to have a balanced budget, but what, is, what the real opportunity for us as a state is the opportunity for innovation. Uh, one thing I've learned in managing uh, really large at-scale organizations and large-scale budgets and what I've learned in, in growing uh, tech companies and working at places like Microsoft is that the, when there's an opportunity, when there's constraints placed on a system like a fiscal constraint, that creates the opportunity for collaboration and for innovation and the chance to do things new and differently. And, and we can't just cut our way to success. We have to figure out a way to provide better services, do more with less, and we have an opportunity to do that across education, across healthcare, across every aspect of government. And I'm excited about the opportunity ahead of us because I know that these constraints will cause us to think new, about new and different approaches and in the end we'll be a stronger and better state because of it. Okay, let's move on to the oil industry. Some critics have complained that state officials have been a little too cozy with oil, oil companies and now of course uh, we're seeing a downturn. Uh, there are even some calls by two people also running for this same office that the oil and gas division should be audited. Uh, if elected, what would be your approach to handling the oil industry? Doug Burgum, you go first this time. Well, I think the number one thing we need to do is do better planning. I mean, we're, uh, we have an opportunity for 50,000 wells in the Bakken, uh, and we're you know, barely over 10,000. And we, we, we've got a lot of this run ahead of us, but we can do a better job. If you talk to landowners in the northwestern part of the state, which I've been doing, I've been traveling around, 
uh, to all of the oil producing counties. Uh, you know, people are saying they're, you know, they're excited about the opportunity, they're optimistic about the future, but we could have done a better job of, of some of the planning and coordinating. And so I think again, but we're, we've got an amazing resource, we have amazing opportunity ahead of us, but with, with the, this downturn gives us a chance uh, to think more strategically about how we want to use that asset going forward. Wayne Stenger, well, response. I, thank you. I, I think that it's always important that we remember we have to have a balance between encouraging uh, development and making sure that we're taking care of all of the other issues that arise. And I think we've done a good job of doing exactly that. Uh, there's been an audit of the oil and gas division. There was a fiscal audit and then also the regular financial audit. We watch those things very carefully. And I, and I always am... Uh, insistent when new businesses come in and I talk to them and I tell them we want to have you here in North Dakota we are we do not want to go back to the days when people when the prairie was emptying out and there were no jobs for people but we do insist you have to take care you have to follow the rules you can't cut corners nor should you have to com, uh, compete with those who do cut corners and so I think that we're doing things right here and I think the n the next level of development in North Dakota is going to be quite different than the frantic pace that we saw before because initially what they were attempting to do is drill their well so they could secure those leases that were expired in five or three years. Those have for the most part been secured and so the next phase of development uh, can be much more orderly. We won't have the kind of frantic pace that we had seen before and so that's a good thing. Okay, Doug Berger, response. I would say one of the things that we want to do to set our state employees up for success and make sure that the companies that are taking risk and the energy companies that are coming to North Dakota, they're choosing to put their capital here, they're choosing to bring their, their team members, employees, and their management here. Uh, it is a balance, but one of the things that the decisions around that big of an industry requires good data. And one way that we can help our state employees is making sure that we give them the very best data. And, and there are a myriad new approaches for automatically collecting data, whether it's oil production itself or managing pipeline spills, uh, whether it's you know, using the new technology of having uh, you know, drones to be able to fly over pipelines and look for spills. We have all kinds of ways to automate that system and we can actually have better results at lower costs with the use of technology, and it'll be better for the companies that are coming to North Dakota, and it'll allow our state employees to do do a great job in managing that important industry. Okay, last word, Wayne Stengem, okay. then we'll move on to another issue. Okay, thank you. And we've already marched, uh, we're marching down that very road, and, and for the reasons that you mentioned, all of the big companies now are having electronic gauges on their uh, machinery so that we can make sure that we're doing those same kinds of things. And there are a number of pipeline companies that are coming in, and they are not just doing the inspections by uh, helicopter and airplane, but the drones are coming, and they can do it because of the kind of technology that they can carry with them that is really remarkable, that can determine if there's any kind of leakage, any kind of problems all along the way. There's a marvelous world ahead of us for the kind of technology that we can employ to do all of those kinds of things. Okay, I want to move on to the Affordable Care Act, which uh, has been an issue in this campaign. This question comes from our co-sponsors, AERP of North Dakota. Mr. Burgum, you've criticized Mr. Stengem for essentially adopting uh, the, the law. I want to ask you both a chance to respond to this and also ask whoever is elected governor, will it be your recommendation to continue funding Medicaid expansion in 2017 or not? Wayne Stengem, you go first this okay. time. Thank you. I, I was never a supporter of uh, Obamacare, of the Affordable Care Act. In fact, the day that that was signed into law by the president, I, along with a number of my uh, attorney general colleagues, immediately filed a lawsuit. We went all the way to the Supreme Court. And I sat in the U.S. Supreme Court for three days and listened to the arguments on all of those uh, cases, uh, it was unprecedented to have a three-day trial on any kind of a case. Uh, now, of course, that law has, uh, was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, much to our disappointment, and it's the law of the land. And so I think that, like m many other things, when the Supreme Court speaks, that's what the law is until it's overturned through Congress or in other ways. As far as the Medicaid expansion, I think that it is important that we continue that Medicaid expansion that was enacted last session. I've spoken to the governor about the importance of including it in his next budget. I think that he will, and, and I think that it's important that, that, that we do that. Okay, Doug Burgum, response. Well, since Wayne's reelection two years ago, uh, Wayne signed on uh, to support a Supreme Court case called King versus Burwell, which defended Obamacare in front of the Supreme Court, and that was the point that we were making. We thought it was important for voters to understand 
uh, that while he was opposed it in the past, he was defending it uh, in the present. And that was the, the single point that we're making. But in terms of the Obamacare as a piece of legislation, it's, it's horrible for North Dakota. It's horrible for rural health care. I've seen its effect. I know what it, it does. It, it kills jobs. It raises cost. It doesn't, know, it doesn't make care either more affordable or make care better. It's really about insurance. And there's aspects of, of the Obamacare that are important in terms of like protecting people with pre-existing liability or pre-existing conditions. Uh, but I believe that we can create with approaches if we free ourselves from a federal program of 12,000 pages of regulation, we can, we can create a system here that will work better for our citizens and better for our geography and better for our people. Wayne Stendham, response. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I read the brief. I don't know if you ever read our brief that we filed in uh, King versus Burwell, but I was not standing up to support Obamacare, but I was standing up to support the taxpaying citizens, most of them low income, who once Obamacare was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court were required by law to buy health insurance and they bought it on the promise that there would be a tax credit for them to help augment the price of the premium they paid for the health insurance that they bought. I think that it would have been a terrible disservice to 16,000 North Dakotans to use them as a pawn in a very dangerous chess game that would say, you bought that insurance, you paid hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars for that insurance, but now we're gonna yank the rug out from under you and take those credits away. That's the wrong thing to do for the citizens of North Dakota. And even though it, you should also be aware that since the King versus Burwell, I also signed on to two other challenges to Obamacare. The Hobby Lobby case is one example, and there was another one as well. But I don't think that it was the right thing for, this, for the honest, law-abiding, tax-paying citizens of North Dakota who bought that insurance with a promise to yank it away from them. It's the wrong thing. And I think, too, Doug, that the original, authentic Doug Burgum would have told me, you sign on to that, Wayne, because it's the right thing. Okay, final word on this, Doug Burgum, then we'll move on. Well, Wayne, I've heard, I've heard your uh, defense of why you defended Obamacare uh, in the 2% in the of North Dakotans, the 16,000, and, and it gets my reaction that the authentic Doug Burgum is, knowing how bad this is for the economy, knowing how a $3.2 trillion healthcare economy in the U.S. cannot be regulated centrally, that I feel that there was ways that we could have managed those 2% of North Dakotans differently through legislative action, others to support them. This wasn't the only way to help them get the, the economic value of that, of that tax credit at a federal level. But what I really am more concerned is that, that if that logic applies, then, then we as Republicans, or you applying that logic, would be supporting every large scale tax and spend redistribution scheme that helped 2% of North Dakotans. Because we know socialism doesn't work and socialized medicine doesn't work. And, and it's not, it's like I said, not good for North Dakotans, not good for America. Okay, let's move on to our next issue. Now, this is another issue that Mr. Stenjum, you've challenged Mr. Burgum on, and that is angel fund investing uh, with your career in business, Doug. What is this exactly? And I'm gonna let both of you talk about this and respond to criticism. Doug Burgum, you go first this time. Well, the first thing I would just say is I, I stand by my record of investing in North Dakota. I have a lifetime investing in North Dakota. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure I've done you know, as much or more investing in job creation in North Dakota in my lifetime than anybody who's ever run for this office. And so I, I stand by that wholeheartedly. And the second thing is, which I think it ought to send a chill up the spine of any law-abiding citizen in North Dakota to know that we have a candidate for governor who's willing to use political theater to try to advance a political agenda around uh, around a, a program which was passed by Republicans, supported by Republicans, voted expanded by Republicans, and that every single person who's using the angel tax credit in North Dakota is doing it in a way as it was intended and following the law, whether it was reporting or investing, everybody's following the law. And so if, if the legislature wants to change this rule, they can do it. Uh, but they shouldn't be they shouldn't be singling out investors uh, and making comments about their law-abiding activity uh, as a way to gain a political advantage. Okay, Wayne Stenger, response. Well, I, I think that the original intent of the Angel Fund was to encourage people to take this tax credit so they could make investments. And I believe the legislature intended, and certainly will indicate that they do intend, that those, fun, those funds be used for investments in businesses here in North Dakota. And so the question is going to be asked, what have you done with the tax credits that you got to employ people and create businesses here in North Dakota? Not the 13 of the 17 that you got credits for that were uh, for businesses outside of the state of North Dakota. And I really find it a little disingenuous that you want to defend so 
critically and zealously your tax credit when just on the last question you wanted to take away the tax credit from the citizens who bought insurance and those are the poor people of North Dakota. Doug Bergham response. Well, I, this is uh, maybe this is an example of where you know thing a lifetime in politics versus lifetime in business really becomes a clear differential point, because at the state legislature has a program called the Seed Capital Tax Program, which is explicitly designed for people that want to invest in North Dakota. The Angel Tax Credit Program, created by the legislature and followed legally by everybody that approved it, was about attracting capital to North Dakota. That's what that program was for, because North Dakota was 47th in. In the, in the country in terms of having capital to fund startups. Because you talk about wanting to diversify the economy. When we want to diversify the economy, we need capital to help us do that, to do that. And that's what that program was intended. And, and then it's also, you're suggesting that I got tax credits for these things. The firm, Arthur Ventures, which I co-founded with my nephew, receives zero tax credits. Those tax credits go to our investors, and I wouldn't have any way of knowing if any of those investors took them because we don't have their tax returns per law the way it should work. So the claims that have been made have been false and the statements again have been chilling because again, are, are we against people investing capital in our state? Is that the point that you're trying to make? Okay, final word, okay. Wayne Stanley. And no, I wanna make it clear that I support the angel fund, but I think the question is going to come up and the interim committee that was established in 2015 by the legislature wants answers to the question, what are the citizens of North Dakota getting out of that? That's the simple question that people really want to know. What are we getting for it? And they will then make a decision of whether it's worth it or not. And I certainly don't want to be critical for and accuse anyone of not following the law. I clearly understand that that's not an issue, and I hope you understand that I've not said that. But I do want to know what the answer to the question is. What are we getting out of this? Because, because the question of continuing the angel fund will be coming up. It will be front and center next session, and I think that we need to have answers to those questions because we don't have enough money to continue those kinds of expensive programs when there are other programs that simply are likely to be much more of a priority. I okay, need to move on to one more issue, and that's drug issues, dominating our headlines, heroin, opiate abuse. I know your, your office, the Attorney General's office, has dealt with drug crimes. There's a lot of drugs floating around the West Fargo School District. There was a memo that came out a couple weeks ago on that. What programs, if elected, would you institute to combat drug issues in the state and stopping the sale of and transportation of drugs into this state? Wayne Stengem, you go okay. first. Thank you. And this is a big issue, and it's not something that in 60 seconds I'm going to be able to cover because it's just a huge issue. But we need to fundamentally rethink what it is we're doing in North Dakota, and I've been saying this for months, if not years, about what we're doing with our justice system. We're incarcerating too many people whose problem is not uh, necessarily committing criminal offenses, but they're they're addicted to uh, drugs or alcohol. And 80% of the people in our juvenile in our juvenile justice system and in our correctional system have addiction problems. And we need to make sure that we're doing a much better job, fundamentally, of assuring that we are providing treatment that is adequate, available, affordable, and continuous. And I hear this all the time. So that's one thing we need to address. Also, the issue of demand reduction, and I certainly am also uh, not advocating, there are some people that just plain belong in prison, and it's my job and has been for years to make sure that that's where they go, but we, we uh, as a society, make to make, need to make a fundamental change on how, we, how we're addressing all of those issues, and this is going to be one of the hallmarks of my administration going forward. Doug Bergham. Well, one, one of the places these addiction problems are starting is with prescription drugs, and there are reports either it's four out of five or nine out of 10, but again, this goes back to a, uh, some of our comments earlier on a federal health care program. Hospitals and organizations today are compensated uh, based on patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction is driven by surveys on what their level of pain is. So we're incenting our doctors and our health organizations to increase the number of prescriptions which have grown exponentially, which is at the front end of this problem. Uh, Attorney General Stengem's working on this. I applaud his work. We're Republicans. This is something we would both agree on. Uh, and I would just like to, you know, again point out, Wayne is in the middle of his term. I voted for Wayne. Uh, and this is in his wheelhouse, whether it's incarceration, it's drugs, it's crime. All of those have increased while he's been in this leadership position. And as governor, I would look forward to working with Wayne as he continues to drive forward on these important problems for the state of North Dakota. Okay, it goes fast. We need to move to closing statements. Oh, I don't get to reply. Uh, no, you can do <laughs> it right. in your closing statement if okay. you want. We're out of time. Right. Wayne Stengem, you go first okay. in your closing well, statement. Well, let me just say I think thanks. he was praising you, actually, for that. So. <laughs> 
Let me then just say that, Doug, thank you for recognizing that issue because it's not a political issue. It is something that is a fundamental issue here in North Dakota, and I have been working for years on addressing it. I want to thank uh, you once again. This, this uh, 30 minutes has gone by way faster than I thought. Uh, I want to simply uh, uh, conclude by thanking the citizens of North Dakota for electing me to office. I'm now the longest serving attorney general in the history of North Dakota, and I think that that is because over the years the citizens have recognized that I am somebody with a positive attitude, with integrity, they know me, and they trust me. And so I'm offering myself to move on and serve in a, another capacity to address a lot of the issues that are looking uh, that we're looking at here in North Dakota. But I am very optimistic about where we're going in the state of North Dakota. And I ask the citizens of North Dakota to join me in uh, a Stengem administration. And thank you very much for your consideration. Okay, Doug Burgum, closing statement, one minute. Well, I love North Dakota and I believe in North Dakota. And I've spent my life creating jobs and building companies here. I spent my life recruiting kids and capital back to North Dakota. I spent my life diversifying our economy and strengthening our communities. Today we've got an economy that's too dependent on prices we can't control. And we can do so much more than wait for prices to come back. And as we diversify our economy, we have an opportunity to create the best education system in the world, the best rural health care system in the world, and the most transparent, accountable, and efficient government in the country. But success requires a new path and a departure from the status quo. Success requires leadership that has spent his life working in the private sector, building innovative systems and approaches that have survived the tests of competitive pressure. That's what my running mate, Brent Sanford, the mayor of Watford City, and I bring, the proven business leadership to strengthen our economy, empower local communities, and put North Dakota on a trajectory towards exceptional. I ask for your vote on June 14th, and we'd be honored to have your support. Thank you. And thank you for watching this coverage of election 2016. Doug Burgum, thank you for being here. Wayne Stingham, good luck June Certainly. 14th. June 14th is the primary. Thank you for watching Prairie Public and AERP of North Dakota's coverage of election 2016. So long. Funding for election 2016 coverage is made possible by AARP, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to helping people turn their goals and dreams into real possibilities and changing the way America defines aging. And by the members of Prairie Public.